Okay, let's get going. Welcome, everyone. Um, so, uh, this is uh, not well. Um, as a reminder, this applies here too. So, um, and before we get going, so first, um, uh, some announcement. Uh, uh, the ISG has uh, approved two documents uh, from the ETF um, from this work, work group. So, Congratulations to Nat, John, and Mike for finally getting approval for the JAR document. Um, just for your, your information, the work the, the draft, the work group draft was submitted in 2014, and the individual draft was submitted in 2010. So this document has been in the work for a very, very long time. So um, congratulations to, to the authors. Um, uh, another document that was approved uh, is the job for a uh, profile for access token. So, Vittorio, um, congratulations on that document too. Yours wasn't as bad as, as the job document. So, uh, we are the champion, my friend. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Um, Agenda for today, Security BCP is our topic for, for today. We still have three more topics or three more meetings um, to go. So lots of lots of good stuff coming. Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing. Any anybody has any comments, questions? Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and let uh, Daniel take it from here. Okay, thanks. Okay, that's that rock. I are you sharing something? I, yes. I don't see anything yet. No, okay. I'm gonna paste the link. Uh, uh, yeah, I can see something now. I'm gonna paste the link to, to the meeting. So if you if you haven't added your name, please add your name and um, let's get going. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Um, yes. But... Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay, um, thanks everybody for joining. Um, today we're going to speak about the OAuth 2 security best current practice. Um, this has been in the making not for quite as long as the drug draft. Um, I think work on this started uh, 2015 or 2016. And um, this is joint work by Torsten, John, Andre, and me. Um, just a quick recap um, what's in the draft. Um, so the aim of the document is to describe the best current practice for OAuth 2. Um, of course, there are other documents um, like RFC 6819, and this document um, is not intended to replace all of them, um, but it updates and extends um, what is written in the other uh, security considerations. Of course, it inc incorporates all the um, uh, experience that we gathered from practice and as you know, also from research and uh, covers a couple of new threats um, that we identified, uh, in particular, those that are relevant to high risk environments like banking and EID but not only those, uh, also very basic stuff, um, such as how to handle redirect URIs and so on. The current status of the document is that um, there was a first working group last call, um, end of, um, actually end of the year before, last year on version 13. There has been, uh, the last interim meeting was on version 16, that's half a year ago, and now the current version is 17. Um, so what's new since the last version? First of all, um, this has been, um, this was also a result of the last interim meeting, the use of metadata is now recommended. That means for both servers and clients, uh, we say that they should use or should publish metadata um, according to RC 8414. Um, Reason being that it, we hope that it reduces configuration mistakes that also could impact security. For example, misconfigured um, token endpoint URIs or something like that. 
Um, we have seen that it facilitates a better mix-up protection. We'll get to that in a moment. And we also hope um, as a side effect that it also improves developer experience uh, because it means less manual configuration. Um, using metadata is also now the recommended way to announce Pixie support. Before that, we said that um, implementers should use either metadata to announce Pixie support or a custom deployment specific way. That way is still open, but um, metadata is recommended. It is um, announcing Pixie support is important because we want to um, have clients that can rely on Pixie support. And of course, if you want to rely on Pixie support, you, um, you need to know that Pixie is actually supported by the server. There are a couple of minor security improvements. Um, for example, um, we before said that clients must not expose open redirectors, but of course the same goes for authorization servers as well. We also have that authorization servers must reject non-HTTPS redirect URIs um, with the exception for native clients where the URLs point to the same device using some kind of localhost address or a custom scheme. We also have a clarification and security model um, that explicitly states that attackers can collaborate with each other. Before this was um, implicit, we made it explicit following discussions on the mailing list. The main, main um, Just change. Daniel, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Just one second. Uh, uh, Philip is in the queue. Do you want to take questions now? Should we, or do you want to wait? Um, I would prefer if we could do that after the um, next slides. It's uh, just three slides and okay. we could go into the discussion. Okay, keep going. Thanks. Um, the main point in the new update is an improved mix-up mitigation. As you know, previously we recommended to use separate redirect URIs for each issuer. This enables a client to identify from um, essentially from where um, the authorization response is coming. And the nice um, or the, the advantage um, of this solution is that it's completely based on existing OAuth features. It's, it just means that you have um, yeah, used separate redirect URIs and register them and so on for each issuer. However, over time we noticed that um, First of all, this is not suitable for schemes with a centralized client registration. So where one client registers once, but uses many issuers or authorization servers, um, as we have seen, for example, in open banking environments. We have also noticed that it really needs a lot of explanation um, to understand the concept. Um, as you can see, I said, separate redirect URIs per issuer because per authorization server is not sufficient. So this needs explanation and it is easy to get wrong um, opening up um, implementations again for mix up um, attacks. Also, we found that it's um, quite hard to automate this kind of um, registration and use of separate redirect URIs um, in, in, in code, um, which means that there's manual work, either manual work um, required or you have to have libraries that um, make specific assumptions about the ecosystem they'll be running in. So overall, um, a working, but not a very good solution. Therefore, um, Carson and I, we created the uh, OAuth issuer and authorization response draft, which defines the ISS parameter for the authorization response and metadata flags and also how to process this response and so on. And um, this parameter, of course, is nothing new. Um, this has been discussed since um, mix-up attacks were first discovered. It's something that for which we've already formally proven the security. Um, so it's a, it's a good mechanism. Um, and it's easy to automate in libraries uh, because it's very simple to just check this parameter in the authorization response. Um, 
when you know that it's, it, it should be there. So you have the metadata flag, you can look at it and then process this response parameter. So um, we found that this is a much cleaner solution, even though it requires this new parameter, but it, um, it's, a, uh, it's much cleaner and easier to implement. And also it needs a much less explanation. So the um, current or the new recommendation in the security BCP is as follows. First of all, a mitigation against mix-up is required when the client interacts with multiple authorization servers. Then we recommend to use a mix-up defense by identifying the issuer, which means that you should use um, the new parameter, the ISS um, authorization response parameter by default, so to say. But um, if you have the same information already because you're using OpenID Connect or JAM or maybe other um, features, that already provide an ISS claim in the response, uh, in the ID token, for example, then you're fine to use that as well. How to use that? Well, that is written in the um, OAuth issuer response, uh, authorization response issuer parameter draft by Carsten and me. Alternatively, if, for example, you don't really have issuers um, because you don't have metadata and OIDC and so on, um, or maybe there are other reasons why I wouldn't uh, use um, one of these two options. Then there's still the alternative of using per issuer redirect URIs, but um, there are several things you need to watch out for. You need to process this in a certain fashion, and the details for this are still in the auth security topics, so you can still do that, but um, it's recommended to use the easier alternative. This means that we now have um, closed one of the, what I found, big issues with the security BCP, and that is a robust defense against mix-up um, attacks. Um, overall, I feel that we have all the important areas now covered. Um, we also have some experience with this in practice already. Um, of course, many people are already following uh, the recommendations we have, although it's only a draft. In more specific, it is also the foundation for OAuth, for the security part of OAuth 2.1. And in the OpenID FAPI working group, we have the new profile FAPI 2.0 already aligned with the security BCP, telling you very precisely how one um, instance of this could look like. We also have a couple of future topics um, that might at one point go into the same BCP or go into different um, BCPs or RFCs. For example, um, you've maybe seen the um, discussion that we had on the mailing list regarding specifics of mobile environments. Um, I feel that there's a lot of, um, yeah, a lot to learn in that area or a lot to, that we still need to write down for example, how to do secure app-to-app -app redirections on, on Android, iOS, and so on. But this goes way beyond the scope of the security BCP. So I wouldn't recommend to put that into the security BCP, especially because it's not um, new attacks that we're seeing there. It's essentially um, variants of existing attacks. So I would propose to update BCP 212 or RFC 8252. Um, which is worth for native apps um, with these details. And also what we will see um, pretty sure is that the higher security level that we achieve right now, and also with FAPI2 and auth 2.1, um, and the new security model that we introduce will probably bring people to also expect a higher level of security in certain areas. So I expect that um, over time, there will be new topics coming up, um, maybe new attacks that um, people come up with. And I feel that these should go into future updates of the BCP. We can't leave the BCP open forever. So I feel that overall, the status of the document is better than it has been um, at any time before. And this 
in my opinion, is ready for the next working group last call. And if we do that, it would be great if at the same time we could say that, um, so to say, whatever attacks we have not come up with yet um, go into a future update of the BCP so that we can close this document um, or draw a line um, in order to not keep it open and update it forever. So that's it from my side. And let's start the Q&A or discussion or whatever. OK. Um, first, um, I'm going to post the link um, to the chat here. If you haven't added your name, please, to the list, go ahead and add that, because I see uh, we have 18 people here. But uh, what I see on, uh, on that page there, we have less number people here. So please add your name to the list. Um, and now let's go and open it for questions. I think Philip is in the queue. Thank you, Rifat. Um, Philip Skokan, out zero. Um, Daniel, if you could please go back to slide number five about the minor security improvements. Um, the second point where the AS must reject non HTTPS redirect URIs, there is an exception for native URL, native client URLs pointing to the same device. Um, now, in the draft, also in your presentation, it mentions with local host URI or a custom scheme. Now, BCP 212 actually says using localhost is not recommended and in general proposes to use loopback URI rather than localhost. So I'm not sure if the draft is using localhost as the actual host name or if it's ruling out the possibility to use loopback addresses um, in favor of using something which 212 says is not recommended. Um... At least the intention is not to disallow anything from BCP uh, 212. Um, so I, I'll check the wording and um, yeah, so we, we want to allow um, loopback as well. Any loopback. All right, cool. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, George. Uh, just a second. Which uh, BCP was that? I'm taking notes. Yeah, go ahead. Um, 212. That's, 212. That's the app out uh, pattern. Both for native. Yeah, so I guess the only point I was going to make is that we probably shouldn't recommend or, or mention, uh, I don't know, I worry about the, the whole custom scheme thing. Um, because the 212 specifically says don't use, it's, it's, it's best practice to not use custom schemes and instead you use claimed URIs. Yeah, um, we refer to BCP 212. Okay, so, so the, we, we don't, don't have any. Make, we don't want to make new recommendations. It's just um, essentially we, we only care about the HTTPS part or not HTTP part in non local host UIs. Okay. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, it, it might be it, explicitly in, in, in the BCP, if we're explicitly mentioning custom scheme, it might be better to replace custom scheme with, you know, claimed URIs. Yeah, and leave the customs. Uh, I don't know. I, I see your dilemma. Um, ugh. Uh, you, you know, you, you specifically kind of have to mention custom schemes because that's the non HTTP part. The claimed URIs are going to be HTTPS. Yeah. Right. But by by pointing those out, I'm afraid it's going to point people to using that mechanism versus the other, which is problematic. Yeah. Um, so, that's that's a very good okay. point. Um, I have it on the radar now, and maybe we can just refer to a specific section in uh, two one two. Okay. Maybe yeah, that that might be simpler than in yeah. calling it out, and then. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else has any yeah. comments, questions? Okay, I see the queue is empty. Anybody has any concerns so far? Okay, good. So, okay, um, I think um, I'd like to see if they, if this uh, the, the people on the list here and on on this meeting here is uh, ready to go for um, 
quick group last call. So um, I'm going to ask you to uh, to hum for that <laughs> by adding plus one to, to the list. So go ahead, uh, Dennis. You have a question? Dennis. Thank you. Well, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Fine. Well, I guess everybody saw the conversation this afternoon on the mailing list about one of my favorite topics, which is not privacy, but which is uh, the Alice and Bob collusion attack, where Alice and Bob are two users and they want to attack the, uh, the, the server, the RS server. Well, currently the document is referencing all, well, basically the old document, which is 6819, where you have the following sentence. Two of the three parties involved in the OAuth protocol may collude to mount an attack against the third one. With such a sentence, you are thinking there is a client, there is an, an AS, there is an RS, but this sentence is not considering the case where you have, for example, two clients collaborating against an RS. And uh, it is supposed to be addressed in the new document, which is the updated OT2 attacker model in section three of the current document. But it is not the case because this document is considering different kind of attackers, A1, which are web attackers, it's also considering A2 networks attackers. It's considering the A3 attackers that can read, modify the content and so on. Attacker four that can read that non modify. And attacker five that can acquire an access token issued by AS. None of these attackers are considering, can be considered as collaborating clients, voluntarily collaborating together against the RS. So the model is not sufficient today. It doesn't cover that case. And there's not a single sentence at the end of the paragraph which says attacker can collaborate to reach a common goal that allows to consider that the client collaboration attack is covered. So I really insist that to be covered. And I also insist because there is a solution or there is a countermeasure to counter this kind of attack. Well, I have proof text that is referring to a joint token, but that can be generalized to any kind of token as soon as the concepts are observed. So uh, there is an encouraging message I received last week from Daniel this afternoon. Well, he says that he's not sure that he understands correctly. Well, I've been talking about that topic about for four years, and as he mentioned in an earlier email, I mentioned that the first time in the Zurich uh, OAuth working the, the, the workshop. So clearly there is a nice drawing where Alice and Bob collaborate, where Bob is making all the computations that Alice needs to basically present a token that was basically issued for Bob, and she presents that nicely to the RS because Bob is making all the cryptographic computations that Alice needs to do the attack. So the best example is to say, well, the access token contains an information, a claim saying I'm older than 18, and Bob is in this older than 18, so he got a tested token, but that token can be transmitted to Alice, which is younger who is younger than 18, and that's a trick. So maybe I'm not the best place to explain that if, if Daniel cannot understand that, but I believe it's really straightforward. So I would really appreciate that before going to last call, there is a section that explains that attack and that explains the countermeasures as they exist. Daniel, do you have any comments on this? Uh, not really sure where to start. Um, first of all, let's start with the attacker model. Um, A1 clearly says that a web attacker can
can operate network endpoints, any network endpoints, meaning a client, resource server, authorization server, uh, any other server, whatever. And they can operate their own user agents and they can participate with all of these in the protocol. So of course, a web attacker can operate, say, a client. Uh, two web attackers can each operate a client. They can collude with each other. Um, they can participate as proper legitimate clients in the protocol, or they can try to impersonate or use the access token off or in any other way, um, try to, to undermine the security um, of the system. So clearly this is covered. Um, Daniel, so, uh, which section is that? Just per the notes. Um, that's uh, section three in the, in the security DCP. Yeah, so this is definitely covered and this is not the, the main problem here, um, what I'm seeing. So I'm, I would very much welcome input um, from others here, but my impression is that this attack is trying to undermine something that is not really by, by the structure of OAuth, um, something people would expect. So that's, that's the, the gist of it. Um, for the details, I think they are better discussed on the, on a mailing list. Okay. Um, George, is, is, are you like trying to respond to this specific topic? Yes. I think if okay. I understood, if I understood Dennis correctly, his attack is functionally an attack against bearer tokens. And so to me, you know, bearer tokens and, and those things are covered in RFC. C, you know, in the in the core OAuth RFC, um, and so I don't know that we need something stated again, right? Because the fact that it's a bearer token is what allows Bob to get the token, pass it to Alice, and Alice presents it, right? You know, the DPOP and other things that Daniel have presented are ways to create, you know, you know, proof of possession or send a constraint tokens. But for me, this is just a bearer token attack, and it's just a function of the fact that in OAuth, the tokens are bearer tokens. So I, I don't, so, so to me, it's kind of outside the scope of OAuth specifically. It is a valid attack, right? If that is something that is of concern and in that context, right, then, you know, people should be looking beyond bearer tokens to any of the center constrained mechanisms that exist, MTLS, DPOP, otherwise. Okay, Thank, thanks, George. Um... Dennis. I would like to respond if possible. Okay, go ahead, Dennis. So two response. First, my attack has nothing to do with the bureau token. If the token is protected by a key and we must demonstrate the possession of the private key, well, Bob can do all the computation for Alice and Alice will demonstrate the possession of the private key. So it's not related to bureau token at all. Second point to answer to Daniel. The problem of attacker is that there is no web attacker in the attack I am considering. The clients are not attacking their web server, their direct web clients. They are modifying voluntarily their web clients so that they communicate. But they want to attack the RS. So they are attacker against the RS, only an attacker for web server. So this attack is not covered by the model at all. That's my main concern. I'm not sure you just said um, they are not attackers. Then you said they're trying to attack the resource server. Which is it? But they're not web attacker. Why not? They're operating they're clients. Or... No, they are modifying. There is no an external attacker to these two clients. They are voluntarily modifying their client code so that they can talk directly to each with each other and then poof on well attack TRS and yes. the attack so they are attacking. attacking so they are attackers. So no. even though they are based on a normal client behavior, normal client code, and maybe they are just one of them is just running normal client code, 
um, they still collude to, to reach a common goal. And this goal is to undermine some security property of the resource server. That's what you're trying to say. That has nothing to do with the definition of what the web attacker is today. <laughs> you, have, That's exactly you, have, the you have basically three elements. And if you consider only these three elements, you can not see the attack. And if you, have to, if you have attacker against these three elements, you cannot see the attack. You have to imagine that each element may be replicated in a number of ways. And when two clients are collaborating, they can collaborate against the RS and they are attacking the RS. There is no web attacker in this area. You just said that two clients are attacking something. And a web attacker model is a model where a participant, which in particular can be a client, behaves maliciously, can also operate two clients. So this is exactly what is covered by the model. No, the, the text says A1 that you have set up website. In my attack, I never set up any website. I'm sorry. Okay, let's. Uh, we have a few other people in the in the line, so let let's give them a chance here. Um, Dick, go ahead. Well, the I'm not sure whether Dennis is trying to say that the language doesn't quite describe what he does, but it seems like it does. But there, he thinks that it's an attack on the RS that Alice is impersonating Bob. But from the RS point of view, it doesn't really matter. It's Bob's resource, and if Bob wants to go and give it to Alice, then he's given it to Alice to work, right? How is that any different than Bob just using a number of different clients to access his own resource? So it's not really no. clear what the attack is. No, no, no. It's, if, it's if, not the point. It's not the point. Can I finish, I, Dennis? Can I finish? Yes, you can. You're 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 coming across very angry, and we're trying to have a nice conversation here. The if you, if the attack is that the RS only wants to you know let people over 18 access something, you're now moving into an identity protocol instead of an authorization protocol, which is out of scope of OAuth, which is an authorization protocol. You know Bob owns a resource at the RS, and Bob has a client that is accessing that. You know by definition that's what OAuth is. If if you're looking for trying to prevent an attack of somebody proving something that they're not, that is an OI. Okay, um, Justin. Yeah, um, just to follow up a little bit from what George was saying, this isn't just uh, limited to bearer tokens because if uh, Bob is willing to share his access token, Bob is, and that's the key point. Bob is willing to share his access token. Bob is probably also willing to share his private keys to make that presentation. It adds an extra step, but it doesn't actually prevent anything. Uh, but more importantly, what it also doesn't prevent at all um, is Bob just going in doing things for Alice. Like this, as far as the resource server is concerned, uh, Dick's 100% correct here. This is Bob doing everything. It doesn't matter to the resource server like the person running the software uh, on the other side because the identification and authorization artifacts in play here are abstracted from the entities in the real world. And uh, so this so-called attack as uh, Dennis is describing it is completely equivalent to Bob taking his existing software calling Alice and saying, all right, which API calls you want me to make? All right, I'm going to go make those, and I will just email you the results of all of those API calls. Bob's allowed to do that. And as far as the RS is concerned, this is exactly the same as a different piece of software with the access to all of the same authorization, uh, sorry, authentic authorization information, yes. Uh, so the keying material and the token material um, with any proof of possession mechanism making the call. Yeah. May I respond? Yes, go ahead, Dennis. Well, two points. First, Bob is never sharing his key. Bob is making some cryptographic computation 
at some point of time only to help Alice. So Alice never knows the private key of Bob. That's a key point. Second point, some people spoke about impersonation. Of course, and that's the key, key issues. If, if we'd be able to identify in the access token that Bob is calling, then the attack would fail. So the important point to have a success with this attack is that the access token does not contain any identifier able to identify that it is Bob. And then the attack may succeed because no one will know that Bob has helped Alice. And that's a key point. Now, as soon as the RS is able to relate the token to Bob and not to Alice, then the attack will fail. And another point, the communication is done by Alice. Alice is using its own HTTPS sessions. She is using that. And as soon as the access token would have been accepted, she can do whatever call she wants because now she is more than 18 and she can ask whatever movie she likes and thing like that. And Bob is not able, able even to know what Alice will be doing now that she's 18. So that's another key point. Um, can I respond to that, please? Yeah, go ahead, Justin. Yeah, uh, no, no, and no. So, um, my gosh. Uh, okay, so Alice is making the call with Bob's token material. So uh, any auditing system would tell Bob, hey, these are the calls that your account is making. Like, this is not... Um, you know, this is not Alice acting as Alice and doing something with an attribute of Bob's on a session that she has. This is Alice acting as Bob, impersonating Bob and being Bob for all intents and purposes. This is not Alice pasting Bob's birth date onto her driver's license in order to go buy alcohol. This is Alice taking Bob's driver's license and the store being able to say, hey, Bob, your driver's license showed up here. Um, you know, and so I, I think there's a lot of conflation of different layers of security that's happening in the description of this attack, most of which are not relevant to the layers of security that are addressed by this level of protocol. I feel we don't understand ourselves. I just mentioned that in the claims content in an access token, there is no way to identify that the access token is coming for Bob or is for Bob whatsoever. So it is not for Alisa as well. It is just for anybody. So if there is no way to identify who the access token was, was really given to, then the attack may succeed. This is what I said that if there is a subclaim or some equivalent of a subclaim, then the attack would be defeated. And I completely. I'm sorry, that is incorrect because an access token given to Bob that says, hi, this is Bob's access token, which you can do today through lots of different means can still be given to Alice and Alice can present it and that token will say, hi, this is Bob and the resource server will say, hi, Bob. Yeah. That's the whole point. Only a job access tokens mandate to have the subclaim present. And it is nice, very nice. But if it is not present, that's where the problem comes. No, I'm saying even if it's present, this still works. How can you identify that it is Bob where there is no claim about Bob? Even if you identify that it's Bob, it doesn't stop the attack. It Alice wouldn't. would still use Bob. No, it wouldn't because Alice would use Bob's token. Once again, if there is no claim that no, 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 please, please. I am saying if there is a claim in the token that says the of subject is there is a claim to attack may be defeated, but the problem is that currently. No, I'm not saying, Dennis, I'm sorry, but I don't believe you are hearing me. I am saying if there is a claim in the token that says this token is for Bob then Alice can still present it. What you are describing does not defeat the attack. It does not 
change the nature because this is not an attack. Yeah. Um, Hannes is in the queue. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm wondering, I'm wondering about a couple of things. Uh, one is uh, Dennis, no, it was, um, it was Daniel actually, uh, who first said like, this is the, the attacker model is, or this attack is covered in the broader attacker model. Um, and then we, we moved on to um, discussing on like the details of the attack. And to me, uh, from what Justin said and, and George earlier, it sounded a little bit like if um, if you're worried about this type of attack, uh, um, there is not really a way to mitigate it regardless on what information you include in there. Uh, despite that we have some um, claims in for use with uh, access tokens that can present or carry information about to whom the token was issued, for whom the token was issued and so on. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about how to best proceed uh, yeah. on this topic. Maybe, maybe one important point here. Um, so we have to distinguish between the attacker model and the things we're trying to achieve or trying to ensure. So this basic setting or, or the setting required um, for this attack to or to execute this attack, namely to collaborating entities um, that some way or the other give each other access to um, the resource server or, or secrets or whatever, um, that is covered by the attacker model. However, um, that does not mean that this should be uh, considered an attack, and this needs to be something we need to talk about in security BCP because um, the goal um, that you can achieve with this attack is not something that um, OAuth is trying to protect against. So if we have these collaborating parties, then it is really obvious that they can do such things. And as Justin said, this is really uh, something that can apply to a lot of um, um, yeah, a lot of concepts. Um, so we we already have um, things covered like an access token um, getting to an, an attacker by accident, and yeah, essentially. This goes into a similar direction. It is not giving out the access token, but giving somebody else access using your own token. Um, and it's not by accident. It is on purpose. But really, this is nothing that, first of all, you can, as we have just seen, uh, really defend against with the things we have. And second, it's not really something you would expect somebody um, needing to defend themselves against. Uh, yeah, th thanks, Daniel. Um, yeah, I, uh, that's, a, that's a good um, question or a good aspect to distinguish uh, between the attacker model and which attacks we, we care about. Uh, so a, a question to you, Dennis, um, why, why do you care about that specific attack? Is that something that uh, you encountered in in like practical deployments or or how did you run into this issue well that's a very good question um, one of the most difficult points to be solved today is to, pre to demonstrate that you are more than 18 without saying who you are and that may be valuable under some conditions and I have presented at the OAuth workshop in Zurich in 2017, a solution that never, nobody really looked at because I believe I was too early. So, well, I have designed, I have not experienced, but I've designed a solution able to solve that concern. And um, at the moment in the ISO working group, uh, there is a, a proposed new work item proposal 
to tackle the problem of age verification, to know whether you are more or less than 18 or even during the range of ages. Well, I believe that OOT can cover the point in under some cases, but it cannot cover the point unless there is somewhere in the access token a specific subject identifier that allows to identify that it is that the claims are related to Bob and not to Alice. So what I'm simply saying is that if you have some identifier that indicates that the access token belongs to Bob, that's fine. There is no more attack possible. If the RS is checking that indeed this relates to the Bob account, open, for example, using the sub identifier of Bob. But if this is not present in the access token, then you have a problem. Now, I know that OAuth cannot go any further in the direction because the, 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 there is no relationship between authentication identifier and subject identifier used in uh, OAuth. However, if you use a smart card, you may do that link, but this is outside the scope of OAuth, but I just wanted to indicate that it is possible to prove that you are 18 without revealing who you are. So basically, you are older than 18 and you demonstrate that under a pseudonym. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, I wasn't aware just of uh, this Anna, specific... Anna. Just okay. one second. So I'm going to cut the line after Aaron because we want. I want to try to wrap it up and see what what we can do next step. So Hannes and then Aaron, and then after that we'll 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 try to make some decisions here, take some steps to to move forward. Okay. Go ahead, uh, mm -hmm. Hannes. Yeah. Yeah. I was um. Yeah. I wasn't aware of this uh, of this new work in ISO on this. Um. So I. I'm curious as to whether um, you would then, or your plan is to um, contribute to that work and contribute OAuth plus some new, um, let's say, claims that you could register. And, and maybe that could actually be um, a possible approach. I don't know if ISO wants to develop something entirely new. Um, or not, or whether they are interested in in sort of reusing and extending on top of OWASP. That maybe I can simply say that it's a general approach, and this will be discussed tomorrow afternoon in the SC27 working group five meeting. SC27 okay. working group five. Okay, I am um, not you participating. If you are a member of that working group, you can participate tomorrow to the first discussion on this topic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Aaron, and after that, Justin. Okay, but Aaron, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks for clarifying the scope of of the use case, and that sounds firmly out of scope of OAuth. As soon as you are talking about identities of users, that's not really where OAuth is uh, based in. It's not the goal, and anything you're talking about attributes of users or identities of users, that's much more in the realm of OpenID Connect and several other extensions, and it doesn't really have a place to bring that stuff back into the core, unless we start expanding the scope of OAuth, which I don't think anybody is uh, very excited about. So given that that is the main concern is handling claims about users being over 18 and things like that, it's just not an OAuth problem. So it's not, something that even makes sense to address in in the spec, I don't think. And I agree that uh, Justin's, Justin's point in the chat of sol solving that by including more information about users sounds like a privacy violation. Uh, so I, I, I don't even think that's the right path to go down and it's just not part of the scope of, of OAuth. Thanks, Aaron. Um, Justin, and and we'll wrap up after Justin. Okay. Yeah. Um, all very, very good points, Aaron. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to raise that I think there might be a way to address this topic in the BCP, but in a different way. Um, because 
what I believe and what I'm hearing from others is that this isn't describing an attack on OAuth, at least as any of us uh, consider it. It is, however, describing some fallout of the nature of the protocol. Whoever can present the information is the presenter of the information, basically. Um, and to me, it seems like the security BCP would be a good place to discuss that kind of thing. We already have text in there about if you're presenting a bearer token, then you're you're using the bearer token. And the same would be true of DPOP keys or MTLS certs or any other proof of possession mechanisms or or anything. Like whoever has the what we can or you know, even client secrets and things like that. Um, whoever has the secret material can act as the party for the secret material. So if you share that with someone else, they are by definition able to impersonate you because these secrets are what differentiate you from everyone else. And yes, including pre-computed uh, calculations of presentations under that umbrella. Okay, let, let me just uh, make sure I, I I got what you're saying, Justin. So you're saying you suggest that we capture the use case, but not necessarily talk about the solution for that use case. Right? No, 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 no. What I'm saying is that in our discussion uh, of the nature of the protocol uh -huh. um, in the BCP, this this isn't a use case. This isn't an attack. This is just kind of how things work. And um, what what kind of made me think of this is uh, is every time Daniel said, "Well, this is obvious," and I agree that it's obvious, but part of the job of spec writers is to write down all the obvious things for the people who don't think that it's obvious. Sometimes, okay. right? Like the introspection spec says that the server must be able to introspect the token in order to introspect the token. <laughs> I, I think that's obvious, but we still put that in. Right, in order to set the appropriate expectations for the server uh, and for server developers. So uh, I, I'd like Daniel's, like if he's got a hot take on, on including this, I don't think it has to be a deep discussion on this, but th this is the nature of the protocol and, and the systems. Daniel, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, yeah. Justin, I think you're right. Sometimes it's good to write down the obvious. Um, and I think um, that shouldn't be an issue at all. Um, the problem that I see is that I do not think that this covers what Dennis has on his, mi on his mind. Um, and I do not think that this will be the end to the discussion. Um, although, obviously, um, I've I think Justin, um, um, Dick, Aaron, George made very good points here um, from various angles um, why this yeah, is, is not um, really an attack in the scope of the OAuth security VCP. Okay. Uh, Dennis, are you okay with the with um, Daniel capturing what uh, uh, what Justin just just described and and described the issue. Yes, that... but my response can be my response is simply no. I don't agree. Okay, okay, that, that's fine. Okay, so what I want to do right now is that I want to uh, get the the uh, the feeling from this team from from this group if they want or think that this attack, collaboration client, I, I'm gonna call it collaboration client, should be part of this document or not. So that's my question. So if you support adding this attack to the BCP, please add your vote to, to the chat, plus one. Okay. Okay. So, and we, if you are again, the opposite question, yeah. Say, say that again. 
Um, we should also ask the opposite question. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. If you are against adding that um, uh, collaboration, collaborating client attack, please add your um, your yourself to to the chat there. Plus one. Okay. Okay. Thank you, guys. Uh, okay, so I think uh, there is clear kind of support of making sure or not adding this to to the list to of uh, of things to address in the uh, in this document. So uh, this this topic is closed right now. So let me ask you a, a different question about um, going for a working group, working group last call. Um, again, I'm going to start. If you uh, support uh, starting a work group last call, please add yourself to the list. Plus one. Okay. And if you are against starting a work group last call, please add yourself now. Okay. Um, okay, I think uh, this is clear support for moving forward with the document as is with the, with the, some um, changes that we discussed earlier about uh, Philip's point. So uh, otherwise, I think um, the document is ready to go to work group last call. Uh, and we'll take it from there after. Uh, so Daniel, after you update that document to represent or to reflect that change, uh, we will start a work group last call. Um, that's it, I think. Anybody has any comments, questions before we end it here? Um, uh, I, I just wanted to bring up a last point. Uh, thanks to all who responded so uh, quickly to my call for the bar uh, feedback on implementations and also IPR disclosure. So if there's any last thing that people want to um, sort of add regarding implementations they have uh, for bar, um, post it to the list and I'm, I'm going to add it uh, to my Shepherd write-up. Um, my plan is to send that off or finalize it um, today or tomorrow. So, it, um, so please hurry up. Okay, awesome. Thank you all and uh, thanks, Dick, for taking notes. Appreciate that. Okay, see you guys. Bye. Thanks, bye. Bye, everyone.